Okay, last time we talked about what we could do with one bit, two bits, and three bits, but now let's extend that to an arbitrary number of bits. So as a refresher with one bit, we saw that there were two unique combinations. That one bit could be either zero or one. If we have two bits, there are four unique combinations. We had what we had with one bit, but now we could tack on a zero or a one. If we go to three bits, we have eight unique combinations. Everything we had with two bits, but we could tack on a zero, or everything we had with two bits, and we could tack on a one. So that gives us eight unique combinations. And continuing on to four bits, we have 16 unique combinations, or going up to an arbitrary number of bits, n bits, then we have two to the n unique combinations. So n times, or two times two times two, n times. And n doesn't have to be very large before we get a huge number. If we have 32 bits, we have over 4 billion different combinations. Now, instead of considering what we could do with 32 bits and over 4 billion combinations, let's consider 7 bits. So we have 128 unique combinations that we could have. Now, let's think in terms of English. We want to write something in English. So how do we do that? What do we need to have at our disposal? So with English, we have 26 letters, A through Z. But if we're writing this, we pay attention to uppercase or lowercase. So there are 26 lowercase letters. There's also 26 uppercase letters. And we might want to write the digits, 0 through 9, maybe like a telephone number or something. So there are 10 digits. But punctuation is also important when we're writing English. And if you look at your keyboard, you'll see that there are obviously 32 punctuation marks in there. But there are some other punctuation marks, the space, the tab, the new line character, you know, the return. So that's 35 characters there. And if we sum those all up, we get 97. So 97, well, that's less than 128. So we should be able to map all these things to different combinations of 7 bits. And you might think, well, that's less than 128. How about if we use 6 bits? So that would be 2 to the 6. That's 1 bit less. That gives us 64 unique combinations. So that's not enough to handle what we want to do in English, in written English. So let's stick with seven bits and try and map different combinations of bits to these characters. OK, so we want to map characters to bits. And we just need to agree on what that mapping is. So how about if one? followed by five zeros and another one maps to the character A. And then we could have one followed by four zeros or one zero. That's the character B. And we can continue on one with four zeros, two ones. That's a C. And on through the alphabet. And we could get to the punctuation marks where this combination of bits is equal to the left bracket. This combination of bits is equal to backslash and so on. So provided we all agree what this mapping is, we can write English. And back in the 1960s, a standard was developed. It was known as the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And it defines this mapping of bits to characters. And it became very widely used. It became the standard. And since then, another standard has been developed. It's known as Unicode. That provides a much larger character set that extends to characters from other languages, whether that's Chinese, uh, Cyrillic, um, Thai, and so on. Now, with 7 bits, we had more capacity than the characters that we were writing here. So some of those additional bits mean things like the delete character or the escape character. 
But provided we have this mapping of bits to characters, we can store Shakespeare in our computer. We can compose our email consisting of text. We go to web pages and read the text. And underneath, these are the combinations of bits that are being used to represent that text. OK, the mapping from characters to bits is straightforward enough. But you know that you could also use your computer to look at pictures. So how do we do that? How do we represent a picture with bits? So here's a picture that I grabbed from Wikipedia of a cat. And if you look closely enough at the display of your computer, you'll see that it consists of little squares known as picture elements. So we expand this portion of the picture. And there's a single picture element, or pixel. And pixels have a single color. So provided we can describe that single color in terms of bits, then we could just think of the picture as a collection of these picture elements. So how do we do that? How do we translate that color into bits? So here's that expanded view of the picture. We'll pick out one picture element. And this has a single color. Let's specify that color in terms of the amount of red, green, and blue. And we'll dedicate a certain number of bits to each one of those colors. So let's say, for instance, we use eight bits to specify the amount of red, eight bits for the amount of green, and eight bits for the amount of blue in a pixel in that little square. So this is a total of 24 bits. But that gives us over 16 million different colors in our palette. And then we could just assemble the picture as a composition of all these picture elements. Another thing you can do on your computer is listen to music. Well, what about music? How do you represent that with bits? So with sound, you can think of that as an acoustic pressure that varies with time. And the amplitude, the height of these deviations is the volume of the sound. And how rapidly these wiggles show up is the frequency. How do we get that into a computer? Well, what we could do is take this continuous signal and sample it at discrete points. And that's what these dots represent. And what we do is we take one of these samples and we discretize it. We map its value to one of 65,000 different levels. We use 16 bits to do that. And then we just make sure that we take these samples at regular intervals. So for a CD, what we do is we sample at a little over 44,000 times per second. And we're discretizing things to 16 bits, so 65,000 levels. And then the acoustic signal essentially looks like this stair-step approximation of the continuous signal. But we don't hear these stair steps. Our ears aren't capable of hearing those stair steps. It sounds to us like that continuously varying sound.